Welcome back. Bitcoin prices have been rallying the last few weeks, jumping near 50 percent in price from early April to now 9,900 in recent days before pulling back just a bit. Former billionaire hedge fund manager Michael Novogratz is a Bitcoin believer, has been from the start. He is now launching a cryptocurrency index. Joining me right now is the Galaxy Digital Capital Management CEO and founder, Michael Novogratz. Mike, it's great to see you again. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for joining us. So you have uh, founded a new cryptocurrency index. Tell us about it. Indeed. So we teamed up with Bloomberg in a partnership. Uh, the idea was to give the crypto community a, a benchmark for hedge funds to compete against uh, for, you know, to think about it like the S&P 500 or, you know, the Lehman Ag when it came out. Uh, I was thinking S&P came out in 62, Lehman Ag in 73. The GS Commodity Index, the, the GSCI, I was on the the trading floor when that happened and the idea was at Goldman Sachs the idea was to give institutional investors access to this new asset class and we thought the same thing with uh, this index with Bloomberg that give the first institutional quality index uh, that will slowly allow real institutions you know pension funds and sovereign wealth funds and big pools of capital to move into this exciting new space. So for a retail investor, for example, who wants to get involved in Bitcoin, maybe they are not sure about doing specific investment in Bitcoin only. You can get into this index and have exposure to lots of different cryptocurrencies. Yes, it's, it's got the How many? Tell me what the index it's looks like. It's got the 10 biggest cryptocurrencies right now. It caps the top ones at 30 percent weighting, and so it doesn't get overly weighted to Bitcoin. Uh, and it floors the bottom ones at 1 percent. Uh, it will grow up to 15 uh, coins once there's enough volume and, and liquidity uh, on, on the right exchanges. And Bloomberg actually runs that whole process. You, you were really one of the early believers. You bought Bitcoin first at what price? Like $96. Oh, my God. That is so fantastic. It went all the way up to what? What was the high? 19900 That's incredible. So did you sell a lot of that? I sold a lot uh, along the way. Um, you know, and... Uh, Part of it was literally a year ago this time, I, uh, I gave a speech at a conference. This is, this is blockchain week. There are conferences Thursday, Friday, and all next week. Uh, the big cons conference is consensus. There are 7,000 people that have paid $2,000 a shot. Wow. Think to go to this conference, to go to the this biggest conference. conferences. So I spoke at it last year, and I got off the stage, and I literally got mobbed like I was, you know, Bruce Springsteen or Bon Jovi <laughs> in New Jersey. It's great. And that, to me, was like a great sign to start selling. Uh, and it was like 11,000 at the time and all okay. the way up to 19,000. And it felt like we were kind of at the tail end of a speculative mania last year. And it was. I think the, the, the retail bubble popped in January when we got to 19,000 in Bitcoin and then uh, 1,300 in Ethereum. Uh, and then you had a big 75% correction, which was quite painful for a lot of guys that bought at bread prices. Sure. So, so what did you see when you bought it below 100, uh, 96? What did you see that maybe others didn't? Because you were really an early believer. Why did you know that there would be a promise here? You know, the whole crypto revolution comes out of a breakdown in trust in, in institutions. And if you think about post-08, and then we did the quantitative easing, and that process took a long time. 2012, we had the European financial crisis. And so it was right there when Bitcoin was kind of starting to at least break into my, my zone. Uh, you know, the Satoshi White Paper was written in 2008. Um, and it felt like there are enough libertarians, there are enough people that thought inflation is going to a zillion. Uh, I mean, you remember, really smart people. Uh, yeah. People like Paul Singer was wanting to throw Ben Bernanke in jail because he thought we were going to hyperinflate mm. the, the, the world. And so there was a real sense that this is an alternative uh, for the cypherpunks, for the, for the libertarians, for the people that want and to And an alternative for gold. It, at that point, it was an alternative money in their mind. Okay. It turned out, to, in my mind, it's an alternative for gold. It's a store of wealth. Let me store my wealth somewhere. Uh, the computer science is really cool, uh, but just as cool as, you know, the token mechanism uh, to create social networks. And so these are peer-to-peer -peer networks. Uh, we don't need to trust the center. We can trust the network, the, 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 the cryptology uh, inside this uh, computer science. Which is why blockchain is so believed, because it's a, it's a structure that you can trust. 
Yes. And so blockchain really is a database. Okay. Uh, a blockchain is a database. It's a really good database, and you're going to see private blockchains all over the place. It would be shocking to me if every corporate treasury in five or ten years doesn't have a blockchain uh, treasury because it's so much more efficient. If you think about Microsoft's got offices all around the world, and at the end of each day, Microsoft Taiwan has got to, you know, uh, equal up with the San Francisco office or the... Uh, or the German office and you know they're wiring money all over the place using the SWIFT system. Uh, in a blockchain database they can hit the one button in the ledger just and wow. so you're cutting out lots of people uh, and you're cutting out lots of mistakes. What, what do we need to understand more about Bitcoin do you think? I mean will we see Bitcoin go back to the highs? I think Bitcoin will go back to the highs once we have a custody solution that people really trust. And so what's interesting is, I mean, there's a, it's a grand irony in some ways. Um, the coins themselves, when they're floating out in the, in, the, in the ether, if you want to think about it, right. are really, really safe. What is at risk is your private key. Uh, so you've got a key with lots of letters and numbers on it. That's your access to your coins. If someone steals that key or you lose that key, you've lost your coins. Mm -hmm. And so protecting those private keys is, is a big industry. Uh, there are all kinds of custody solutions, quite frankly, that are really, really good. We custody a lot of our Bitcoin at a place called Zappo. Uh, I feel 100% certain that they're safe there. But I also know that if you're sitting at the state of Wisconsin uh, and you're responsible for, you know, your state's pension money, mm. you're probably not going to risk your career on a company that's called Zappo yet. Mm -hmm. You're going to feel much better if it says Bank of New York right. or Goldman Sachs. Right, right. That's, that's a very good analogy. And so there's this, in essence, irony that until we get institutional custodians uh, to say, hey, your keys are safe, the big institutions are going to be more reticent. And, now, and, the, and they have been, by the way. And the positive yeah. news is I see lots of players, traditional custodian players, spending lots of time and effort trying to figure out how they're going to get into this business. And so I would bet sometime within the next three to 12 months, you're going to see big announcements, either consortiums or actually individuals saying, hey, we'll custody this stuff. Very, very pioneering of you, Mike. BGCI is the index designed to track the performance of the largest and most liquid positions of the cryptocurrency market. Before you go, Mike, let me get your take on the stock market and the broader markets out there. Uh, what's your take on where we are right now? You know, listen, it's, it's interesting. The we're in a rate cycle where rates are going higher, uh, and the Fed, I think, is going to continue to push rates up higher. Uh, I don't think they're going to accelerate, but they're going to keep pushing rates higher. And so we've got a president that creates lots of instability, uh, both good and bad. Uh, and so there's more political nervousness and risk. We've got rates going higher. At the same time, we've got a synchronized global growth system. And so I think the stock market is going to stay volatile, but it's going to grind higher. Um, I'm less you know, long because on a risk adjusted basis, it's a it's a riskier trade. Uh, but I think, you know, we still have enough money in the system uh, that we're, we're heading higher. Yeah. And, and it's a good backdrop. Economy doing well. Economy is uh, doing well. North Korea uh, <laughs> willing to give up the, its nuclear uh, ambitions, we're told. We're told. So we'll see the, about that. The Listen, the European economy is doing okay. The Japanese economy is doing okay. Right. And so it's the first time, literally, since I can remember, we've got a synchronized global shift to the right. Um, and as, you know, we get an inflation number like yesterday, a little bit lower, it's just okay. Because the risk really would be that the Fed has to accelerate and rates rates go up. And finally, we say, wait a minute, what are we doing? Right. But inflation uh, hasn't been an issue It so hasn't far. been an issue. Right. So we have a little bit of this Goldilocks scenario here. Uh, exactly.